everyone and welcome to The Chrissy B Show, the UK's only TV programme dedicated to your mental health and well-being. Today we're supporting Migraine Awareness Week and we'll be exploring how suffering from migraines can affect our mental health. Supported by the Migraine Trust and Migraine Action, Migraine Awareness Week is an annual event devoted to raising awareness of migraine as a serious public health issue and to reduce stigma. My guests tonight are media doctor Rob Hicks, who will be discussing why some people suffer from migraines and what we can do to help manage them. Then we'll be speaking with somebody who knows all too well what living a life plagued by migraines can feel like, and that's Katie Campbell. We'll also see what anti-migraine technique has taken the internet by storm, as well as showing you a recipe that is not only yummy, but apparently good for headaches and migraine prevention. And since we have our good doctor here with us, we'll also have our doctor's answer segment to answer any medical questions you may have at home. All you need to do is send an email to info at chrissybshow.tv. And you can also send us a private message on Facebook, which is The Chrissy B Show. So let me now just give you a few facts. Migraines are said to be the most prevalent neurological condition in the UK, with one in seven people suffering from them, with two thirds of those suffering being women. Migraines cost the UK around £2.25 billion per year, and there are approximately 190,000 migraine attacks happening every single day. And we've also checked out social media, and there seems to be a lot of misunderstandings when it comes to migraines. So it can actually be very difficult uh, for someone who's never had a migraine to actually imagine what it's like. But here's what a few people have to say. Uh, this person says, I've had a migraine all day, finally fell asleep, and I'm woken up by a text message from a person I don't know. I want to murder that person. Someone else says, migraines are just life's little ways of saying, no, you haven't got this at all. What you've got is a migraine. Uh, this person says, had four in my life and serious stuff. Good to experience though, as before I had one, thought it was just a headache. And this person's asking for empathy. Um, someone else says, always listen to your body. If you can't keep pushing on, let yourself rest. And someone very sad with um, the emojis crying saying, I have a migraine, make it go away. So a lot of people feeling very low about that. Now, we also have some celebrities who have spoken about the damaging effects migraines have had on their, on their lives. And we have Serena Williams, and she suffered from menstrual migraines since she was 18. And she believes that they've actually cost her some of her biggest tournament losses in her career as a tennis player. And we also have Janet Jackson, and she was forced to cancel a string of concerts after suffering from vestibular migraines, which resulted in vertigo and a sensitivity to bright lights and loud sounds. So not ideal if you're in a concert. We also have actress Marcia Cross, and she also um, struggled to balance her work life with her migraines and often became nauseous on set. And she has since become a spokeswoman for the, uh, it's called Triptan Migraine Medicine. And actually it's not only the glamorous women who've been known to suffer, Hollywood actor Ben Affleck was hospitalized while directing his 2006 film Gone Baby Gone, following a severe migraine and believes a regular sleep schedule is the key to preventing them from occurring. Okay, so those are just a few um, celebrities that are also going through a difficult time with migraines. But now let's talk to our own real life story guest, Kata Campbell, about her experience. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thanks Thank so much you. for coming to talk about this. Thank now, I know this is the first time you're speaking about it publicly, and we were, we were talking earlier, and you know, it's, it's really important to speak about this because people just don't understand what mm -hmm. it's like for, for someone that does suffer from this. So, so when did you have your first migraine? So I had my first migraine when I was nine years old. Um, nice. So that's, that's 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it so, so clearly. Um, I was at a, a nice restaurant with my dad, um, having some nice rich food, which I think is what caused it. And all of a sudden I, I couldn't speak properly. Um, which is wow. aphasia, which is one of the many symptoms um, of the type of migraines that I suffer from. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's basically where you, you're you trying to say something and the, you can form a sentence in your mind, but when you try and speak it, it comes out like nonsense and just, mm. you know, like 
gobbledygook you can't make sense of it um so my dad thought being age nine at this nice meal I was just playing up but I couldn't communicate that actually I was in lots and lots of pain um and it was very very scary like not just not being able to as well apart from the not being able to speak properly can you describe the the pain what kind of pain it is um I that particular migraine i don't remember the pain so so much um it was it was all very new to me so Mm -hmm. i just i mainly remember the fear of not being able to communicate and actually that's something that's never gone away whenever i have that um aphasia yeah there's that moment where you realize you you can't communicate Mm -hmm. and it's singularly the most terrifying thing ever um paired with not being able to see properly which is called aura mm-hmm. um it, yeah it's it's really really scary but at, at that point i was like i had no idea what was going on i didn't know that it was a migraine i had no idea what a migraine was so mm-hmm. yeah the whole experience was really terrifying did, did your parents take you to to the hospital at that point or did they think you they didn't no, actually realize no, what was going on. No, I just um, got put to bed. <laughs> oh, bless. Which, you know, um, yeah. is kind of one of the only things you can really do for a migraine. Well, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but as as I got older and I kept suffering, um, I was taken to the doctor and they said, yeah, that, you, that I have a migraine, so. How often were you, were you getting them at that point? Um, it got worse as I got into my late teens and early 20s. Um, that was sort of the worst point for me. I was having them at least once a week. Once a week? Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, very often. And the sort that just completely take you out of the game. So... Can you describe what it's like, like from from sort of when it's, when you start to feel it coming until when it's sort of at its worst? Mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. obvious to understand. So the first symptom that I usually get is the aura, which is Mm -hmm. um, either a loss of vision, disturbance in a vision or tunnel vision. and yeah that's so disorienting because you you just have no idea what's going on and that can happen anywhere at any time anywhere anytime um and that usually lasts for about 30 minutes um sometimes accompanied by um the the loss of speech what if you're out on your own somewhere it's terrifying (laughs) yeah it's um it's really really scary Mm -hmm. And, and often it's accompanied by um numbness in various parts of my body so like my tongue or my face and my mm. my hands um often i get paralysis on on one side of my body it sounds like a stroke well Some this is the type i suffer from is called hemiplegic migraine um mm. which is basically migraine with stroke symptoms wow. um and that is followed by nausea often being sick as well mm. and then comes the scary intense head crushing pain um so it's it's so much more than a headache and i think that's that's the main thing that i want everyone to know is that yeah. you know headaches are headache this is in a league of its own really um so yeah that's Sounds that's like an good. average migraine for me i guess yeah. and how long yeah. does it how does that last for days or is it like yeah so the longest migraine i've had was three days long three days with that pain. yeah <laughs> um but also, sometimes you can just have the other symptoms and not the head pain, okay. um, and you know they can last for thirty minutes to an hour, and and mm. then you know hopefully the the head pain doesn't come. Um, but then there's also um, after the migraine, after you, all those pains go away, you feel like you've been hit by a bus for at least a couple of days. So there's that the recovery from that as well. Um, which That's sh- I, I just didn't. I- I didn't imagine it was so Well, well I think so not many deep. people yeah. really know. And, yeah. you know, I think the word migraine is bandied about a lot by people who have a bad headache mm. and, um, you know, just really don't understand all these other the symptoms that, that come with it. Mm-hmm. How, I know, I know you're getting some help now and you're taking some medication, so mm. you're, you're getting these now month, once a month, but how, how has it affected your life in general, like relationships, work, things like that? I think the biggest effect that it's had has been on my work life. Um, so when I finished uni and got my first full-time job mm-hmm. um, doing office work, I was sat in front of a computer all day and that's that's never good no. for, for migraines. Um, and that was before I started taking full-time preventative medication. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, I was still trying out different medications to see what, okay. what worked for me. Um, and I lost two jobs 
um, from from being off of work with migraine. Really? So oh. that's yeah, that had a really big big impact on my life. And because I'd only just started working full time, mm -hmm. it was such a blow to my confidence, and I just. I felt really awful. I got so you're willing, down you're willing to it. go with work and like you know really yeah. get into your career and stuff, and then this just kind of dragged you back. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, but since then, I've um, I've been taking beta blockers um, for about the past four years or so, mm -hmm. and that's really helped. I have much much less problem now. So, do you do you find that people don't really understand what's going on, even your like your friends or, or family? Very much so. I mean, my friends and family are great and, and very, very supportive, but really you can only understand it if, if you've been through it. Yeah, it's because um, of a lot of things, isn't it? Yeah, and that's it. I think it's just that awareness thing. People have no idea that migraine is all of these other things and not just a headache. Mm -hmm. um, so the support is, like I said, it's good from my friends and family. They're very yeah. understanding, but um, I'm part of a couple of online support groups which are also okay. really really helpful because you know there's you know there's people out there who actually know what you're going through mm -hmm. so that's good as well how, how have you coped mentally because it must obviously how, how what kind of things have you sort of been thinking about yourself and about your situation how have you come through that it's very despairing to be in the midst of having a migraine attack like you can't see anything outside of that and mm -hmm. you know if you're at work or um, in a social environment and you have to take yourself out of that and go and just lock yourself in a dark room it's mm. it's really quite depressing um i've i've despaired quite a lot at you know how how will i do anything in my life how will I continue to work full-time how will I mm -hmm. um, you know silly fears like what if I ever get married and have a migraine on, on my wedding day or oh gosh what yeah. if I um, mm. you know what, what, if, what if I want to have children and then I'm going to have all this time when I'm responsible for other people mm. and not really be able to I actually had an experience when I was looking after my niece who was three at the time I took her to the park just me and her and I had a migraine and all of a sudden I couldn't see and I couldn't speak oh, so my little three-year-old niece is just running around and I can't see where she is I can't communicate to anyone else around me what's going on and it was terrifying and that just made me think well you know what if I ever have kids of my own mm -hmm. what will I do so, so there's a lot there's so much to this isn't there there's just that we don't even think about but I'm so glad you're coming on to speak about this, Katie, Thank today. Thank you, me too. It's, it's really like, it, it just opens your eyes. And it, for all of us to be more understanding and just mm -hmm. be more helpful, I suppose, with people that are going through this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, we've almost reached the end of this podcast, but I'm going to keep you on because we're also going to be bringing on Dr. Rob Hicks, who is our regular expert on the show. And he's going to be talking about sort of, you know, what causes migraines and more information on how to manage them and, and things like that. But thank you so much for your story so Thank far. You. We're going to ask you more questions okay. right after this. everybody to our migraine awareness show so before the break I was speaking to Katie about her experiences with severe migraines and now we're also joined by Dr Rob Hicks to give us a lowdown on everything we need to know about them so Rob first of all welcome to the show thank you <laughs> lovely to be back lovely to have you on again so we heard Katie's story earlier we'll do then your comments on her story first of all it's one heck of a story isn't it I mean you know you, you you've battled through more than most with migraine would be faced with with all you know with the paralysis symptoms the loss of vision symptoms the inability to communicate and i think what what struck me with your story was that is the the key things that people are not aware of mm. is you mentioned that people use the term migraine far too freely mm, I do far well. too easily when they've again. got a tension headache or yeah, a headache to do with an infection or something i think the thing about migraine is it just in your words takes you out of the game there's not a question of you 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 do want to continue mm -hmm. you can't into mm -hmm. the dark room you go and you know if you're lucky it's four hours if you're unlucky it's up to 72 hours with with the pain not just the pain but also the nausea the vomiting the sensitivity to noise and the, and the lights as well mm -hmm. and that's just the headache part of it mm -hmm. what you were describing the aura is, 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 is the build-up and that is terrifying you know for for the person with the migraine and the aura but also for those around them I remember mm, when I was working yeah. in hospital medicine and, and a colleague suffered similar symptoms and we none of us were aware 
that she had this condition. And of course, she, you know, the speech was slurred and she couldn't communicate. She then started, you, know, you obviously she had lost power down the one side, and we, you know, honestly thought she was having a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, when it when it started to to dissipate to to, to resolve, she said, "Oh, I, I get these attacks every now and then." And mm -hmm. one of the things I would like to ask you is is the scenario where you can't communicate. Have you ever thought about wearing one of the, the medic alert bracelets? That, that would tell somebody around you that this is what's going on mm -hmm. because I'm sure that sometimes people have wrongly thought oh she's been drinking a bit mm. you know she's yeah does that happen um it's, it's never actually happened to me but it's I'm very anxious of that happening mm. um it's whenever I have those symptoms my first thought is what's what's everyone going to think especially if I'm at work yeah, yeah. um so yeah, it's definitely a good idea. I, I have thought of it. Um, the iPhone also has like a really good that thing where you can look at someone's medical mm -hmm. problems and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's a way to alert people, particularly yeah, yeah. as you said, if you're in a scenario with with your, your niece mm -hmm. um, and you know you can't do something, or they can't look after them, and you're it's making it worse because you're worried about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then they can say, oh, this is what's going on, mm -hmm. and actually. You know, find a way of, of helping you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the other thing I think that that struck me is that is that what you said about people not being sympathetic around you in the workplace. Time and time and time again, we hear people with migraines say, "One of the hardest challenges I face is people assume I just want to take a sickie. Mm -hmm. I just fancy a day off work." Mm -hmm. And of course, what the person with migraine would love to be is at work. They don't yeah, be stuck yeah. at home suffering in the, dark, or yeah. in, in the dark. So I think if we can just get that message across to I, our I think viewers. that's so, so important because sort of you sitting there speaking, speaking about it, I'm thinking, I've, I've said I've had a migraine so many times when I've just had a headache. And it just makes you feel bad like that because you, you know, people that are actually having a, a real migraine, what they go through, and you're just sort of just out for a couple of hours maybe and like you feel okay yeah. afterwards. Mm -hmm. But that, I'm so glad, that's why I'm so glad we're doing this show today because it's opened my eyes as well to this which is really good. And I think, you know, the, the reality is at the moment is, is we, we can't cure this condition, mm -hmm. but increasingly there are ways of trying to manage it. So, you know, you mentioned that you're on preventative medication. You know, we, we've seen the arrival of some treatments over the last 10, 15 years that when people are getting the symptoms have a good chance of, of actually nipping the migraine in the, in the bud if they're taken mm -hmm. soon enough. Um, you know, for some for some people, from a prevention point of view, acupuncture they find is beneficial. You know, some people don't find it beneficial, but some people do. But I think one of the key things is identifying triggers, mm -hmm. isn't it? Is, is and knowing what your triggers are, and then avoiding. avoiding them to the best of your ability. But what actually what actually happens when someone has a migraine? What's well, going on? This in, is in the frustrating the part. We don't know exactly. I think you know theories keep changing, and mm -hmm. we we know that what happens is that the, essentially the the, the, the the nervous system in within the brain becomes overexcited. So it, af it affects brain chemicals, it affects mm. the brain nerves, it affects the brain blood vessels in, in some respect to cause the, for, for you know, up to 30% of people, the, the aura that happens before the mm. headache. You know, it, uh, uh, the other people are fortunate enough, I say fortunate, you know, broadly, not to have the aura, they, they will have the headache. Mm -hmm. um, but research is ongoing to try and identify exactly what, what, what's going on. But in the meantime, while that's going on, what we need to do is make sure that people like yourself who have the condition yeah. have the best advice and, and are, and are, and are empathised with rather than adding additional pressure, mm -hmm. which of course, you know, stress is one of the major triggers. So if somebody says to you, oh, you just want a day off work, that stresses you, and then they, of course it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the common triggers: oversleeping, tiredness, hunger, changing routine uh, for women, hormone changes. Um, yeah, the, the list the list is long, and, and what's important is try and identify individual personal triggers, and as you say, mm -hmm. avoid them as best you can. And apart from avoiding the actual triggers, is there anything you can do to, to help maybe with the nutrition side of things and exercise? Does that help at all? Yeah, I mean, I mean, nutrition point of view is very, is, is very important because mm -hmm. hunger and missing meals is one of the key um, triggers. And what, what often happens is that people get food cravings. Mm -hmm. so, that, so they crave certain foods and then lo and behold, 24 hours later, they get a migraine. And traditionally, we've all, people have said, well, actually, this food 
triggers my, my migraine, but actually we believe that the process of the, the migraine happening you know, happened, came before the craving, and it's a coincidence. So chocolate, for example, was for a long time people say, oh, chocolate triggers migraines, but, but actually the science suggests that actually it's more of a coincidence with that. There are certain mm. foods, so red wine, for example, some cheeses that have got tyramine in them, I mean, maybe a trigger for many people. Some additives, you know, MSG, for example, you know, it might be a it's trigger for some anyone, people. <laughs> but again, healthy diet, plenty of, you know, enough sleep, regular exercise, not overdoing it with caffeine or alcohol, yeah. all those sorts of things. And I'm sure you've you've found, you know, the things that you yeah, need to avoid. What, what works for you? Then? So yeah. I've cut out caffeine completely. completely. Um, okay as well just for my general health as for, mm. as for migraines. Um, I try to avoid red wine because mm. that can definitely be a trigger for me. Um, but actually just hunger is one of my worst triggers. I can't skip meals ever. Mm. Like I have to eat at certain times of the day and mm. if not then I can just, I can feel one coming on straight away. So. And then if you, if, when you feel one coming on and you have something to it, does it go or, or do you still end up having the migraine? Um, it depends really. If I, if I catch it early enough and I'm like, oh right, I'm actually hungry, I should definitely eat something. But okay. if, I, if I can't eat, and then I just have to wait for it to come yeah. really. Oh, so. Well. Yeah. Okay. And what about in terms of exercise and stuff, do you...? So, um, unfortunately, <laughs> excessive exercise is one of my triggers. Really? Yeah, yeah, so it's taken me quite a while to like get into a good routine. Um, mm. But I would say that definitely helps to have, have an exercise routine and to eat healthy. Does anyone help you with that? I mean, have you been to a professional to sort of get the right kind of... Is that, is that kind of help available, Rob? Like, um, the NHS, like, they give uh, advice, maybe? You could, you could potentially get it on through an exercise on prescription scheme. But I think, really, for a lot of people, it is trial and error. Yeah, you, know, exactly. you, you learn yeah, how much yeah. you can do mm -hmm. before something tri triggers it. So mm -hmm. you know that, you, I'm sure you know, you can do a certain, a certain level of exercise and you think, I want to push myself further, but if I do, I'm going to suffer. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's like with the red wine, you, know, you might mm -hmm. be at a party with friends and you think, oh, I could I'd love to have that glass of red wine, but you know I'm really going to suffer mm, mm -hmm, yeah. as a consequence. So, so you know, it, in an ironic way, it teaches you how to be healthy. True. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. not the, it, there are better ways, obviously, mm. um, but it, it's a way of focusing on on nutrients, activities, rest, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and stress management as well. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I think people around you can help because you don't need them stressing you. Mm. You know, and that's why it's so important that we're covering it, is, is to actually let people know that, you know, this is a miserable condition to have to deal with. Mm. However, think on a positive approach and you have a much better chance of being in control of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really important because um, I, 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 even though you're going through so much, but you, you still seem to be a very positive person because you're, you're getting on with things. You still, like you said to me earlier, you, you're still working, you still go out, you still go on holidays. T tell us about that. Tell the viewers how you, you manage to actually keep going even though you do go through these things. So for me, there's really only one way and that's to stay positive because mm -hmm. there's not really an alternative. Um, there's, there's no cure. Uh, it's something that I have to live with. It's, it's part of who I am. And I actually realized that the moment I accepted that, that this is, this is part of my life, that I was just able to be more positive and just get on with things. Um, and it became really important to me to make the most of my healthy days, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and just do all the things that I enjoy and live life to the full. What and do you enjoy? Um, Travelling, um, mm -hmm. seeing my friends and family, just, yeah. Um, so, yeah, being positive is, it's, it's a good medicine, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> best medicine, right? It's the best medicine. I think it's the second best, because I always say that laughter is the best <laughs> yes, medicine. Yes, yeah, definitely. definitely. So, but, but, but being positive is certainly, well, equal, let's call it equal first, yeah. 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 Well, Kate, I really want to thank you again for coming on to speak thank about you. this. I've learned so much. And Rob, thank you as well for, for um, teaching us more about excellent. it. Yeah, and I really hope that's uh, brought awareness to the viewers at home as well, that if you do have friends or family or colleagues at work that do have migraines, that you won't judge them in any way and think, like, you know, like we said earlier, that they're just messing around and they don't want to be at work and things like that. Try to be more understanding because, you know, it is a terrible thing to have to live with. 
But you know, I'm, I'm so glad we've done this show just to just to raise this awareness. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Rob. You're going to stay with us because towards the end of the program, you are going to be answering some of our viewer questions, aren't you? We've got doctors' answers yes, coming up. Yes, we have got doctors' answers yes. later on in the show. And if you want to email us a question, you can do so on info at chrissybshow.tv. We'll see you after this break. CB and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to today's program everyone which is in support of Migraine Awareness Week and I'm really glad that we got the opportunity to speak to Katie who has been going through migraines for many many years and it certainly opened my eyes as to what people go through and uh, hopefully it's helped the viewers as well to be more understanding if you have a friend or family member or even a work colleague that's going through something like this to be you know to, to actually get a feel for what they're going through. So now I'm going to be um, sharing some, a video with you first of all because they do say that good nutrition is vital for our health and an anti-inflammatory diet is beneficial apparently for headaches and migraines. Now nutritionists say that flax seeds with their anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids should be a staple in anyone's diet but also there's the benefit of the added fibre but especially for people that do have migraines and headaches. So let's take a look at this superfood recipe. Hi Chrissy. hi everybody. When I think about foods that make me the happiest, I always think about chocolate. Mainly because it tastes so good, but also because it's been scientifically proven to be good for us, if it's made with natural health supportive ingredients. So most of the chocolate sold in the supermarkets, not so great for us. It's packed with sugar, chemicals, preservatives, flavors, things that can mess with our digestive system and overall health. But there is a really simple solution, and that's just to make our own chocolate. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. So come and join me in the kitchen. We're going to make healthy peppermint chocolate. Let's get started. Chocolate is always a good idea when you can control the ingredients by making it yourself. Begin by melting half a cup of cacao butter, a delicious natural fat extracted from cacao beans, one of the world's most health supportive foods. Cacao butter forms the basis of all chocolate and has been scientifically proven to make you feel happy, alert and satisfied thanks to its vast amount of beneficial ingredients. When combined with cacao powder, also extracted from the cacao bean, it becomes even more potent and dark in colour. To add sweetness in a healthier way, it's best to use an organic, raw, granulated sugar and to give it some crunch and boost its nutritional value, I like to add whole flax seeds, which help cleanse your digestive system and keep your bowels in tip-top shape. To further flavour your chocolate, you can add food grade oils or organic extracts. I'm using peppermint oil to make this delicious minty chocolate treat. Peppermint has a cooling and calming effect in the body and has antimicrobial properties that can soothe digestive issues and freshen the breath. I make this recipe a lot because it doesn't last long in my house. I also like to make it for others for special occasions, so I use a variety of silicon molds which allow me to create different shapes and sizes. If you don't have any of these, you can use an ice cube tray or even a small container that's lined with baking paper. Leave to set in the fridge for about two hours. To set faster, you can put them in the freezer. It's best to store this chocolate in the fridge. It contains only natural ingredients, so it may melt faster than the kind you can buy at the store. I truly hope you enjoy this delicious peppermint chocolate. May it help you be healthy and happy. For the full recipe, please visit the Chrissy B website, www.chrissybshow.tv. Thanks for watching. See you again soon. Thanks very much to Danielle. Now we came across a video posted by YouTuber Camille called Two Minute Headache Buster and this actually went viral clocking up over 1.5 million views. Now in the video this businessman consultant Camille K claims that he can cure most people of their headaches and migraines by repeatedly asking three simple questions. Let's take a look at what he's doing.
So very interesting. And his techniques have actually been met with a lot of praise. So uh, Journey with JC says, are you a wizard? It worked. Whilst A. Wood would reply, they actually worked for 12 hours. Thanks, I had a bad migraine. Some, however, are not so convinced with um, NZ John saying, given up after my fifth try, swear it's made my headache worse, the fact that this didn't work. So how do you think this actually works? Now, I have my own theory, and I'm not just relating this to headaches or migraines, or, but I'm thinking about life in general. So maybe the people that were watching that video and, and saw a difference afterwards, could be because of this first thing, which is belief. So if you believe in something enough, it will probably work for you. So if you're a very positive person and you go for things believing you will be successful, you probably will be. So for example, let's take a job interview. You go in there, you, you're, you're full of energy, you're full of um, confidence in yourself, belief that you're going to get the job you probably will get it because you're going to exude that confidence. But the opposite is also true. If you already go into that interview thinking negatively or thinking that you're not going to get the job, then things will probably go wrong. You're going to say the wrong things. You're not going to come across um, very positive. So you are actually um, speak, the way you speak and the way you, you're thinking already will reflect what you do, your actions. So, and other people will notice that. So it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, in, in terms of um, certain issues and certain problems, there are certain things that where medically doctors will say, and you know, because of research and things, they will say that there is no cure for certain things. I, however, believe that you should still have the faith and hope that there is a cure for something, because I know people that have had incurable diseases, things that you know, people have said impossible for them to turn things around, and they have been healed, they have been, um, they've changed things around. So I think it's important, even though medically things, things are said there's no cure, but, you know, things that was, there was no cure for yesterday, could be, there could be a cure for tomorrow, even medically. But even for the things that are, seem impossible, there is always a way. There's always something that can happen. Miracles happen. Many things can, can happen. So I, I think it's very important to keep that, keep that belief inside of you. The second reason why I think that particular uh, technique may have worked for some people is this action. So the fact that you're actually trying and not just letting, for example, the headache sit there can help with recovery and not just not just with headaches i'm not just talking about that area but anything in life when you actually do something towards something trying to solve an issue you are more likely to to get a result by maybe it could be um, by meeting certain people that have another opinion that maybe hasn't been heard before and they can help you with certain things the possibilities are there but if we just stay in one place and don't move and and just expect something to happen by just waiting it's never going to happen you have to go out there and get certain things the third thing is focus so this is another reason why i think this technique may have worked for people is because of their focus so why do people get things such as, let's just talk about headaches, I'm not talking about migraines, I'm just the headaches. Why do people get headaches in the first place? So of course, sometimes they are caused by medical problems, but other times we cause them ourselves. And I've given myself plenty of headaches when, for example, I overthink, when I'm trying to deal with too many things at once, maybe when I don't give myself enough rest. And when I start to feel the pain, it's a warning to me that I need to slow down. So many times it's us to actually create our own problems. Now, when we take our focus off everything that's going on and stop overthinking, that also helps us to relax and take stock of ourselves and move on. So, you know, those, those are sort of three of the reasons why I think maybe certain things worked for people. But it's just to kind of translate that into everyday life and see, well, actually, if I believe something can happen, if I take an action towards it, and if I focus well, then I can solve a lot of the things that I'm going through. Okay, so just to, just to summarize, life in general can bring us a lot of headaches, but what matters is how we react and then deal with the problem. So you are stronger, a lot stronger than what you think you are. Well, stay tuned because after the break, we'll be going to Dr. Rob Hicks in our Doctor's Answers section. So if you have any questions for him, do email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. Welcome back to today's program, everyone, where we have been speaking all about migraines and headaches. And if that information interests you, please do head over to our YouTube channel in a few days' time 
Chrissy B Show and you'll catch the program there. And also don't forget to subscribe because like we always say, there's loads on our YouTube channel, great for your mental health and well-being. So now we still have Rob with us and this is going to be our doctor's answer session and we'll be answering your questions at home. So if you have a question for Rob, please do email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. If you prefer, you can also uh, leave a private message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. So I have a few questions for, for you to answer today. Good. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them. Uh, the first one is, from time to time, my eyes go blurry or cloudy. This happens at random times and doesn't seem to be triggered by anything in particular. What can I do? So one of the th things that um, I certainly find helps, and many people in the similar situation finds help, is to do the, what we call the 20-20-20 exercise. Mm -hmm. So that's every 20 minutes, take 20 seconds to look into the distance about 20 feet away. And that gives your eyes a, a chance to rest, have a break, and you often find that tiredness, pull-in, irritation actually settles by doing that. But if your eye symptoms continue despite all those measures, you really should get them checked out. So everyone's just going to be staring into space every, every 20 minutes then. <laughs> well, it's imagine everyone in the office doing that. Well, it's not a bad way of relaxing, yeah. if you think about it. You know, it's a, it's a way of um, taking time to relax and yeah. unwind, preparing yourself for the next 20 minutes. Yeah, because you don't actually realise how long you're in front of a computer sometimes. No, and people don't realise that when they're staring at a screen, they don't blink as often as they do mm, naturally. I didn't know that. Ooh, yeah. Very good information. OK, so the next question is, I have a blocked nose, predominantly my left nostril, and have been prescribed a nasal spray called... Momitasone furo, do you know that furo? Mometasone furo. Yeah, oh, I said it completely wrong. Yeah, yeah, that one. I have been using it for a couple of months and it has made a difference, but I heard that if you keep using nasal sprays, your sense of smell will eventually be affected. Is this true? Well, um, it is a rare possibility that if you're using an anti-inflammatory steroid nasal spray like this, that there is a possibility. It's not very, very common. Um, that the sense of smell may be affected. But the irony is of that is actually, normally this is used to improve uh, problems like chronic sinusitis, hay fever, where your sense of smell may be affected in the first place. Um, I think what's important is that you get a proper diagnosis from your doctor. Um, if after a number of months of using the treatment, you're not finding that it's improving, go back and ask to see whether there's an alternative treatment available or whether there are other things that you can be doing. So for example, is it, if it's allergic, it might be reducing your exposure to the allergen triggers. So it might be house dust mite at home, if it's in the summertime and springtime, it might be exposure to pollen. So there are lots of different things that are possible. But bottom line is, have a look at the information leaflet that comes with all medicines, including nasal sprays, and just have a look to see whether that is a possible side effect. And if you think that's the case, have a word with your doctor about possibly changing to a different medication. Okay, great. Oh, we haven't got much time. We've got to whiz through these. Right, this one's from the US, um, and he's, this gentleman says, my urologist took me into TERP, uh, destroying prostate via the urethra. He never told me I would never ejaculate again. That is, semen doesn't come out of your penis anymore. This is permanent. Dry orgasm feels like nothing or hurts. Worst of all, there is no anticlimax. That is relief of sexual tension. They destroy. But back in the 80s, they didn't because the surgeon worked more carefully. A, I can't pronounce it, a sphincter? Mm -hmm. That closes over your mm -hmm. bladder because it is where the vas deferens, mm -hmm. and this is very technical, mm -hmm. and urethra meet, and thus the sphincter allows your sperm to come out, although the prostate itself contributes to about a third of your semen. I want to die. So he's obviously very distressed. Very distressed and sounds very, very angry. I mean, this mm. is, what, in medical terms, what, what he's suffering is called retrograde ejaculation. So the, the semen, rather than coming out through the penis when the man climaxes, mm. it actually goes backwards into the bladder. So the oh. man still feels the sensation of an orgasm, yeah. but he doesn't produce anything. Okay. And, and this is a very recognized um, complication of this operation. The operation is, is essentially to reduce the obstruction to urine flow in the prostate. So it resolves all the urine related symptoms, you know, the of frequency. That, something else. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and up to 90% of men who have this operation may experience this complication. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from a, a sensation point of view, it shouldn't cause a problem. You know, yeah. from a fertility point of view, it can do because, of course, if the sperm's not coming out, it's, they're not, he's not going to be able to fertilize his yeah. partner, the mm -hmm. partner's eggs. But I think what's necessary here is to have a chat with a doctor because I think maybe some therapy yeah, is, he doesn't would, might be a good idea yeah. because of the, the anger and the upset and, uh, and the stress that you're feeling about this situation. Um, so that you know, actually you can get on top of it rather than it being on top of you. 
Okay, we have another one here as well. Uh, this person says, I exercise regularly and I'm fine with walking, running and even jumping, but any time I try to do anything like squats or lunges, I get a sharp pain in my left knee. I also notice that if I am bent down to pick something up, my left knee feels stiff front and back. Well, this sounds like there's a sort of ongoing injury to, to the knee that obviously when it's stressed or when it's exercised, you, it, it's telling you there's a problem. And now if you haven't already had this checked out by your doctor, I would urge you to do so simply to identify what's the underlying cause. Is it a ligament? Is it a tendon? Is, is, it, is it a more significant joint problem? Um, because then you can actually recommend the treatment. So the treatment mm -hmm. might be some physiotherapy, it might be some heat treatment, it may be some cold therapy, it may mean anti-inflammatories, or it may actually mean doing different exercises and laying off exercises of that knee for a period of time. It mm -hmm. might mean strapping the knee with a, with a knee support. So there are lots of things to do, but bottom line is when a joint is causing pain, it is its way of telling you that there's a problem. Um, and so rather than going through the pain, and risking further damage, it's very important to get it checked so you get a proper diagnosis and you know exactly what the best course of action is to solve the problem, treat the problem and get yourself back exercising again. Brilliant. Okay, we've got two, time for two more, I think, Rob. Um, this person says, lately my periods seem to last forever. I get bloated as usual and after a week I get some spotting, which stops for a day or two and then starts again. And about a week later, the blood flow is normal. This whole process takes about two and a half weeks and I'm bloated all the way through. My periods used to last about a week. Well, this is obviously um, an important problem to get checked out because there are a number of causes for irregular bleeding for, for women. Um, one is uh, infection. One is related to medication that may be being taken. So if somebody's on a, a contraceptive, for example, um, that may be causing this pattern of bleeding. Sometimes when a woman starts taking the pill, for example, it actually, the, the bleeding is, is, is irregular. Mm -hmm. um, it might be that, um, that there's some inflammation going on. So the bottom line is to get this checked out. Cervical smear tests, maybe some swab tests and, and an examination. Because to be fair, two and a half weeks out of, out of what's normally a monthly cycle mm -hmm. is a lot of time to be suffering with irregular bleeding and bloating and discomfort and, and, and the, these miserable type of symptoms. What's very important is to identify what the underlying cause is to make sure that it isn't a, of serious nature or even if it's of less serious nature that the right treatment is given. And that might simply be a course of antibiotics, that might be uh, some, you know, some treatment for, for thrush or something to calm down the inflammation. But it's important that these things are not sat on. You need to find out what's going on and then the right treatment can be offered. Brilliant. And we've got time for one more, Rob. Um, this one says, I'm a 42-year-old male and after a friendly football match, I have a pulling pain in my lower abdomen and upper thighs. Any sort of mo movement causes pain. I've not done any exercise for over a month and the pain is a little better, but I still feel it. Sounds like groin strain, doesn't it? Mm. Sound, sounds like Sunday league football, over-enthusiastic. Um, 42, running football, around like yeah, a 20 year old yeah. probably. Um, and, and it's not a criticism. It, yeah. it, it's obviously, people want to get involved with the sport. Maybe you forgot to do your warm ups. Uh, maybe you, you, know, you went in for that tackle a little bit too enthusiastically, but it, sound, it sounds like groin strain. And that can take an, anywhere from you know, four weeks up to a couple of months to get better. Mm. Um, again, unless you've had it diagnosed, you need to get it diagnosed to make sure it isn't a, a, a different problem. So for example, sometimes a knee injury, the pain will radiate from, from the knee and be felt in the groin area. Oh, yeah. um, sometimes it's a problem with the testicles, which actually, it's, and it's just coincidence that the pain arrived during the football match, you know, mm. something was going on anyway. So get yourself checked out, um, make sure that you follow the advice of your doctor and get yourself back on the pitch as fast as possible. Rob, that's amazing. Thank you so, so much. You're very welcome. And obviously, welcome. if you guys have a question, please, please do email us. If we don't have time to, to answer all the questions here on this program, we will answer them and we can email you directly or we can answer them on the next Doctor's Answers. Right, Rob? You yes, must have it to do that. There'll be, there'll be more Doctor's Answers. <laughs> and don't forget the email address is info at chrissybshow.tv. Well, we have reached the end of the program today. 
Thank you so much for all the lovely information. My pleasure as always. Thanks for the questions. Great questions. (laughs) Thank you for all your questions. And don't forget, if also, if you have a story that you would like to share on this program, maybe it's something that you've been through and you'd like to share your experience, or perhaps something that you're still going through and you'd like to see a topic dedicated to that particular area, you can get in touch with us via the website, which is chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Really great, thank you Chrissy. I'm really glad that you're doing the show to create some awareness about migraine. Um, Yeah, it's been great to come on and and talk about my experiences, so thank you very much. Well, that was a bit rubbish. That was a bit rubbish. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I I broke it. To our YouTube channel in a few days' time and catch the show show there because we've had lots of information. I'll just hold it. We'll be discussing why some people suffer from migraines and what we can do to help. Welcome back to our program, everybody. All about my mine. Sorry, <laughs> Mom, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> and she did that in order to show people what you know. Some people that do um, suffer with migraines actually have to go through to make hopefully people be more. Can I start again? Now we we actually found a video which was posted by YouTuber Cam- Camille. Camille view. Okay. And that basically means take 20 seconds to look about 20 feet away um, and <laughs> I can't remember what the other 20 is. <laughs> <laughs> That's <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it was going so well. It was going so well. Yeah. <laughs>